video game consoles, possibly the greatest pieces of technology ever created to help satisfy our simple chimp brains. Over the past 40 plus years, video game consoles have built up a reputation of being one of the biggest forms of entertainment. Many companies have helped push this ideology, continuously innovating and improving their own line of consoles in order to create the best possible experience for video game fans on a worldwide scale, wanting nothing more than to make everyone happy and satisfied with their products. <laughs> Ah, uh, if only that was true. Companies like Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo have always aimed to outshine anything that came before their current consoles, never wanting to stand still for too long for fear of stagnating and losing public interest. These companies have always had it in their head that what gets people most excited for console releases is the new hardware and software that will be a part of them. This has led to many great groundbreaking inclusions to consoles that have since been passed down from generation to generation, lest we forget about Sony and their famous DualShock controllers. Despite these great innovations in technology, there will always be missteps, and well more than these companies seem to let on. I think I speak for most people when I say that these gimmicks are not what excites us most about gaming. Yeah, I get these advancements have helped progress the potential of gaming to a whole new level, but I think what people really get hyped for is the video games themselves. These are the things people remember, not a fancy controller or whatever the hell this is. The early years of every console are the most important. These consoles are banking on future success on their first few game releases. That short two-year window is a console's time to shine. These consoles that succeeded are looked back on fondly and defined by the quality of games that launched with them. The PlayStation, GameCube, Xbox, PlayStation 2, Nintendo Wii. Me rattling off those names then most definitely made you all think of video games you played on those consoles. Unless you didn't have any of these consoles, then this is a bit awkward. A console that is very close to my heart and has been with me through most of my childhood is the Xbox 360. This console holds most of my fondest memories for gaming, thanks to its amazing library of just absolute bangers. There's one game in particular I've been itching to talk about ever since I started this channel, and that game is Dead Rising. Dead Rising is recognised as one of the most successful and prominent zombie game franchises to ever be created, and whilst admittedly the franchise gradually ran out of steam, the sheer brilliance of the first game cannot be ignored. Why exactly is this game so special? Well, there are a number of reasons Dead Rising is such a great game, although it was not the first zombie game ever to exist, or even the first Capcom zombie game to ever exist. Dead Rising helped define the genre as a whole, and pioneered a now popular sub-genre of zombie games, specifically open-world zombie games. Games like Dying Light, Dead Island, State of Decay, and Days Gone may have never existed if it was not for Dead Rising's success. In fact, I even feel many other zombie games may also have never come to be if it were not for the massive success of Dead Rising. As I mentioned, Dead Rising was not the first zombie game ever created, but it went a long way in normalising the genre and brought it to the mainstream. The game introduced so many mechanics that can still be seen in countless games today. The game is not perfect, though. Being released in 2006, Dead Rising was totally revolutionary for the time, but there are some aspects of the game that have caused people to call the game outdated. This is a little harsh, as I still think Dead Rising is enjoyable to play to this day, but that's not to say I'm not all for improvements. Now, we all know about the stigma the term remake gets. Some of them are great, others not so much. Nevertheless, Dead Rising, I feel, deserves a remake, as this could bring interest back into the franchise. Frank West needs another shot to get back in the spotlight. The real Frank West. No, not this impersonator, or whatever the hell this is. Is that the guy from 21 Jump Street? You know how to use this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, let's get on with it and talk about this absolute gem of a game. Dead Rising's story begins with a helicopter flying over the town of Willamette, Colorado. We are then introduced to a strange man with a camera. No, it's not your creepy uncle. It's Frank West, a photojournalist with the goal of getting the scoop of a lifetime once he uncovers the true fate of Willamette. Frank tells the pilot to come pick him up in three days and jumps headfirst into a situation he has yet to realise is life-threatening. He meets a survivor on the rooftop who tells Frank that things are a little worse in Willamette than a few riots. Frank is the character we play as during Dead Rising, and the main protagonist of the story. Now, he may not look like much of a hero, what with that terrible hairline, but Frank is more than capable of getting the job done in sticky situations, and the situation becomes even stickier once he realises zombies have infested the once humble town. Admittedly, it took him a while to come to this conclusion. I thought seeing people being eaten alive on his way into town may have been a dead giveaway. Did you just say zombies? The story of Dead Rising isn't afraid to embrace common tropes found in the zombie genre. The isolated mall setting, a homage to the 
zombie film Dawn of the Dead, outlandish characters and tons of bloody violence. Although from the outside, Dead Rising could be seen as a cliched piece of zombie media, it's very much the opposite. Rather than completely cross the line into horror game territory, it feels more like a dark comedy. There are plenty of times the game takes itself very seriously, but sometimes even during these serious moments, you can't help but smile at how ridiculous everything is. This is probably my favourite aspect of the game, as it allows the devs to have fun with the narrative and characters inhabiting them all. The story of Dead Rising is an interesting one, as Frank has to use his super genius intellect and out of this world charisma to uncover the origins of the zombie outbreak. Speak! Speak, damn it! What do you mean it's not over? The whole story deals with issues like the truth and exposing the lies of those in power, and highlights how these people will also try to silence those who know too much, which really says a lot about our own society. Despite the story potentially feeling small and cramped due to the setting, Capcom did an excellent job at keeping the player interested, and the characters of the game go a long way in making it so enjoyable. Brad, Jesse, Isabella, Carlito, and of course, Big Dick Frank, play their roles in making Dead Rising's story memorable. Despite it being so memorable, you don't have to follow it if you don't want to, which leads nicely into the next part of the video. Dead Rising has some pretty interesting gameplay mechanics that made it one of the most unique zombie games at the time. In fact, it still is one of the most unique zombie games in my opinion. Now in a zombie game, there are many important tools you need to survive. Weapons, food, and allies are the things that spring to mind, but Frank has another tool that is integral to his survival, and that is... Time! Like I said earlier, the game consists of Frank waiting in the mall for three days. This time can be extended a little bit longer if you get the correct ending and unlock overtime mode, but the main portion of this game revolves around the three days. Once you finish the introduction sequence to the game, the game begins to work on a time basis. Once a mission or a side mission becomes available to the player, they will have a limited amount of time to complete that mission. If they don't start an activity in time, it will be lost forever, unless they restart from their last save. Activities will only become available to the player at specific times of the day, and only on certain days, so you will constantly have to look at Frank's Rolex to ensure you have enough time to complete each mission. This adds a good layer of challenge to the game, especially for someone who wants to complete every side mission along with the main story, as it leaves little room for error. Now, obviously, Frank isn't a psychic, so he needs someone who has a good knowledge of the mall to help him navigate it, which leads on to possibly the most important character to Frank, Otis. Now, I didn't mention Otis earlier in the main story segment, because he works better as a gameplay mechanic. Frank needs information on where to go and who to meet, and Otis is the guy who helps him with that. This makes Otis seem like a pretty stand-up guy, but him helping Frank inadvertently makes one of the most annoying game mechanics present present in Dead Rising. When a mission is ready to start, Otis will call you, which means you have to manually pick up and listen to where he tells you to go. This makes you incredibly vulnerable to zombie attacks, and heaven forbid you get attacked by a zombie while Otis is talking to you, as he will berate you for being incredibly rude. Otis man, you really are a savage. But deep down, He's a nice guy. He even saves you during the initial zombie attack if you don't make it. What a nice fella. Now, if Frank is going to uncover the truth of Willamette, he needs to show the world visible proof of the horrors within the town. So he puts his photojournalist skills to good use and photographs anything that could be useful. The photo mechanic is probably one of the most memorable mechanics of the game, and one that is so unique for a zombie game. Most zombie games have you shoot zombies, but not in the sense of giving them a photo shoot. We are introduced to this mechanic at the beginning of the game when Frank first enters Willamette via his helicopter. This short segment gets the player familiar with the camera by allowing them to take pictures to earn PP. PP, or prestige points, are the game's XP system, which the player needs in order to level up Frank and make him a much more capable zombie killer. There are many ways the player can earn PP. Killing zombies seems like the most obvious, but surprisingly, this is the least effective. In fact, taking pictures is probably one of the most beneficial ways a player can level up Frank, as they get rewarded based on the quality of their photos. Capcom incorporated many genres a player can try to include in their photos. Horror, brutality, drama, erotica, and outtake. People didn't buy this game for taking photos though, they bought it for the zombie killing, and this game provides a lot of tools to kill zombies. With a lot of marketing for the game, Capcom pushed the gimmick of being able to use whatever you could find in the mall to kill zombies, and honestly, this wasn't too far from the truth. Most interactable objects can be used to theoretically kill zombies. I mean, a lot of them are incredibly useless, but the fact that you can throw CDs at a zombie 
coffee and throw shopping carts just adds to the already cartoony and humorous tone the game is going for. As well as this fun gimmick, Capcom decided to make the killing extremely satisfying, with unique kill animations for certain weapons, as well as accurate sound effects that help sell the brutality of the weapons. Honestly, you can't help but grin as you cut your way through hordes of zombies effortlessly, but that grin quickly fades once your weapon breaks, then you immediately go back to shitting yourself. Capcom knew they had to make the game challenging, and this was another great way of doing it. Once a player uses a weapon too much, it will break and they will be forced to find another in the mall, which is great as it encourages the player to experiment with different weapons and utilise the environments around them. I mean, yeah, long-time players know of ways they can keep weapons longer, insert 5 mini chainsaw and horror magazine combo here, but for a player's first time, this definitely adds a layer of fear. Let's talk more about the PP system for a quick second. Like I said, PP lets the player rank up, which can improve their health, speed, as well as increase the amount of items they can carry. Leveling up also unlocks special moves the player can perform to help them in combat. These moves are some of the most brutal ways a player can take down zombies, but they can also be very useful if you are stuck in a tricky situation. During your playthrough of Dead Rising, you will most likely take a hefty amount of damage from zombies and other enemies that I will get onto later. Luckily for you, you're stuck in a mall, which is full of good quality medical supplies you can use to patch yourself up with. Now I know you may be thinking, bandages, plasters, perhaps some painkillers, but no, all you need my friend, some good quality food down you. Frank's health can be replenished by many of the food items found around the mall, all of which have varying effectiveness. Of course, beggars can't be choosers, and like the weapons, sometimes you'll have to make do with what is in the environment around you, which means you may have to patch yourself up with snacks, which heal fuck all. If the huge array of weapons doesn't encourage you to kill zombies at first, then the kill counter in the corner surely will. Capcom knows how to get our small monkey brains hooked, and watching that bad boy go up gives you pure joy. There are many secrets the player can find hidden around the mall, such as weapons and PP stickers, which are located on certain landmarks and advertisements around Willamette that grant you PP if you take a photo of them. Another fun detail I love about the game is boxes and trash cans can be destroyed, revealing hidden items within them. What the fuck, is that a handgun in a trash can? Oh, oh. Right, sorry, I forgot this is America. Using a firearm for self defense is our God given right as Americans, Thomas. One of the greatest things about Dead Rising, however, is its difficulty. Like I have already mentioned, Dead Rising has many elements that make it a challenging game to complete, as well as having to deal with time and strict deadlines. Capcom found other ways to make the player feel vulnerable. When playing the game for the first time, the huge zombie horde can be really daunting, as their massive numbers make them seem untamable. However, being able to use pretty much anything around you to help protect yourself really helps the player quickly settle in. It doesn't take long for you to feel like you actually have a fighting chance against the zombies, and then it turns to night and things get scary all over again. Between 7pm and 7am, zombies become aggressive and are much harder to kill thanks to their increased health and endurance. Such a dick move from Capcom to throw such a hard curveball so early in the game, but it's a great reminder for the player to not underestimate the zombies, as they are far more dangerous than they seem. Even after all the zombie slaying and the story, Capcom didn't feel like the experience was enough to satisfy the player. There was something else that needed to be added to the experience. That element was survivors. Throughout your escapade in the mall, you were able to encounter many survivors, each with very unique tales to tell Frank about their current situation surviving the undead. This is not the extent of survivors though, as just like the time element of the game, they had a whole new level of challenge. The main goal with finding survivors is getting them back to the security room where they will be safe from the horrors in the mall. Rescuing survivors offers the player some of the biggest PP rewards in the game, which ultimately encourages most players to help those poor souls find safety. Okay, so getting them back to the safe house doesn't sound so hard. It should be pretty easy, right? Oh, you poor fool. Capcom knew just how irritating escort missions could be. I mean, they're responsible for Ashley after all. The AI in this game is so dumb, you soon realise that a lot of the challenge comes from having enough patience to deal with this AI, as I have found myself abandoning AI out of pure frustration. Sorry guys, but I really don't want to miss this scoop. Don't worry though, I'll come back for you. <laughs> Ironically, one of the harder parts of the game makes the rest of the game much easier, as the more survivors you save, the more pp fueled Frank becomes. Not all survivor interactions are a straightforward find and lead back to the safe house, as there are some cases where the player will have to perform extra steps in order to get these people to safety, whereas most of the locations of survivors are told to Frank by Otis, some remain hidden throughout the mall, and you have to use your thorough investigation skills to track them down. Or you know, you could just look up a guide. Others sometimes react a little bit hostile towards Frank, and need a little bit of encouragement 
judgment to set them straight again. Elderly or injured survivors tend to stagger and slow down, so it's more effective to carry them or hold their hand, if given the chance. Sometimes certain survivors have an option to be given items in order to entice their decision making. However, depending on the survivor, it can either be the right or wrong thing to do. Some survivors even continue to be complete dicks, even after you save them, stirring up panic in the safe room unless you fulfill side quests. So ungrateful. Go on then, Kindle. Let's see how well that plan goes for you. Oh, look, not so very well. I know it sounds like I hate this aspect of Dead Rising, but honestly, it's more like a love-hate relationship. Getting survivors back to the security room can be tedious at times, but it's so satisfying getting them back to safety and watching that PP meter fly up. Plus, you keep a notebook of all the survivors you encounter, showing you all their happy faces after you rescue them. Aha, look at his face. He's so happy. Not all of the survivors you find in the mall are friendly, however. Some of them have crossed the point of no return, and the sudden arrival of zombies has caused their sanity to crumble. These are the very special type of survivors that deserve their own dedicated segment of the video, and I intend to do just that. Psychopaths are the bread and butter of the Dead Rising franchise. These are the survivors Frank can encounter throughout the game who actively seek to kill you. These guys are the most recognised faces in the series for their unique designs, theme tunes and personalities. Psychopaths can be found in both the main story and side missions throughout the game, acting as bosses for the player to fight that utilise different weapons and fighting styles. Each one of the psychopaths in Dead Rising is completely different from the last and act as perfect caricatures of people who have completely lost their minds in the zombie apocalypse. Like your average, sane survivor. Psychopaths can only be found at certain parts in the three-day cycle, and choosing to not go and confront them in the allocated time means you can no longer meet them in that current playthrough. Many of the psychopaths are introduced in radically different ways to the player. Whilst you could argue that Carlito is the first psycho you interact with as you fight him during the first case of the game, I prefer to consider him a main boss of the game as typically psychopaths are residents of the town. I feel it is much more appropriate to label the convicts as the first psychopaths you meet. This confrontation comes as a shock to the player player due to the location and timing of it. The convicts attack Frank in the outdoor park area of the mall, a place the player has already been through to complete the first mission. As a result, it is a complete shock to see these enemies in this location, as from a first glance the park seemed like the least dangerous part of the mall. The rest of the mall is cramped at times and zombies tend to cluster around most of the floor space, making it difficult for you to navigate it. However, in the park it is a lot more spacious and gives you a lot more breathing room to map out where you need to go, but Capcom just love to kick you when you're down and turn the once safe wide open space against you, as these psychos have commandeered a military truck with a mounted machine gun on it. As you can tell, this gives them a lot of breathing room to warm up their tyres and run your ass over. Again though, it teaches the player a valuable lesson. Some survivors are dicks. They are a lot more entertaining than regular survivors though, as they each get their own cutscenes to help establish their personalities and even motives for why they have become what they are. Clint is a great example of this, as he has a very real reason for wanting to act out violence against anyone who crosses his path. His granddaughter died during the initial zombie attack and partnered with his severe case of PTSD he got from Vietnam, meant he was no longer able to think straight. Although his actions are not completely justifiable, you are still able to sympathise with him due to all the messed up stuff that happened to him. Clint is just one example that highlights the greatness of these freaky characters, as well as specifically fitting into the world of Dead Rising. Many of them reflect typical character tropes common within other forms of media that contain zombies. Adam the Clown was a former children's entertainer whose livelihood was completely destroyed when the zombies attacked. Adam utilises many of his wild tricks as deadly attacks, and proves to be a pretty tough psycho to encounter so early into the game. I think this guy is so memorable because so many people were initially terrified of him. I think this because that's exactly how I feel every time I fight him. Clowns, man. They're not the nicest things in the world. Cletus is another psycho, like Clint, who you kind of feel sorry for, as although he threatens to kill Frank and does kill another survivor, you can see just how scared the guy is of the whole situation, that he feels completely backed into a corner. Another standout psychopath for me is definitely the cult leader and sub Consequently, his cult. The cult is initially teased a little earlier in the game, with posters advertising their presence, hung up on many of the walls in the mall. This detail isn't totally obvious at first, but you learn to appreciate it once you've played the game enough times to realise what it is referencing. The initial interaction with the cult is a strange one, as Otis does not inform you of their presence in the mall. They just kind of show up, ready to make a sacrifice, when suddenly they catch Frank lacking behind them. The cult leader makes a quick escape whilst you are left to deal with his underlings, who all wear the same green mask and yellow jacket. Somebody stop me! 
once you kill these guys or run away like a bitch. You think that that will be the last you see of them, but what you don't realise is that that was just the beginning. The cult seemingly took over the mall in a matter of hours, taking refuge in many locations around the map. Single cult members are not very dangerous, but much like the zombies, they are in large clusters, and if you aren't careful, they will drug Frank and take him back to their hideout to be their new hideout sex slave. For me, the leader of the cult was probably the weakest aspect of the cult, as I found the whole mystery surrounding the other members to be a lot more intriguing. There are literally hundreds of these guys around the map, and with the population of Willamette being around 53,000, it seems as though every 1 in 500 of the residents was a cult member, which is pretty concerning for the town. Maybe if these guys weren't so busy dicking around in their coats, then maybe the town would have had a fighting chance against the zombies. Many of the psychopaths offer a lot in terms of gameplay variety, incorporating their own profession and personalities into their attacks. Jo is a psychopath that very much translates her personality shown in her introduction into her boss fight. Jo is a corrupt cop who takes out her sexual frustration and desires on unsuspecting survivors who she arrests and threatens to abuse until Frank intervenes. During her fight, Jo continues this twisted sexual behaviour as she will go out of her way to attack the survivors she has tied up. Jo is one of the most underrated psychos in Dead Rising, as a lot of people seem to forget about her due to how easy she is to beat. I think it's a little bit unfair to not give her at least some credit, as she was the first female psychopath and she also proves that women can do it too. Despite the horrible decisions a lot of these psychopaths make, Frank is a strong believer in second chances. This leads on to Paul, the psychopath. Paul is a very insecure individual who tries to take his frustrations out on two other survivors before Frank steps in to take him down. Once you defeat Paul, he sets himself on fire, seemingly killing himself in the cutscene. Once the cutscene finishes though, Paul is still alive and you are given the chance to save him by putting out the fire, but not before you take a humorous picture of his burning crotch. One of the strangest and at the same time cool psychopaths has to be Kent. Kent is more like a wolf in sheep's clothing, as at first he seems like a normal survivor with his own set of quests for Frank to do. Like Frank, Kent is a photographer and even offers to give Frank a few pointers, acting somewhat like a tutorial for the player on how to use their camera. Although he comes across as egotistical, he doesn't seem evil. After you complete his quest, Kent gives Frank some more work to do as he wants you to get an erotic photo worth over 750 PP points. I just showed you. You think you can handle that, huh? Yeah. Getting this photo is a lot harder than it seems, as the only two ways of obtaining one before you have to meet Kent again both require you to do other scoops in the game. The most reliable way of getting it is during the medicine run scoop, which is a main scoop in the story, as Jessie sits in a certain pose, allowing you to take a picture of her, um, two personalities. After giving this to Kent, he seems pretty defeated, almost like he wanted you to fail, and tells Frank to meet him again at noon to finally settle the score. This is when you start to feel that something isn't quite right with this guy. When noon comes, Kent confirms your doubts as he attempts to zombify survivor and photograph the instant they become a zombie, and when Frank intervenes he points a gun at you and thus his journey of becoming a psychopath is complete. Kent is not just one of the most unique psychopaths in the first Dead Rising, but probably in the entire franchise, as you have to go so far out of your way to even be able to fight him when most psychos can just be fought immediately when their scoop is available. Kent's final battle can also go two different ways. If you meet Kent on time, you stop him from killing the survivor and you can keep all your items in the fight, however failing to meet him on time changes things drastically as he has already infected the survivor and ties Frank up with a chain and strips him down to his undies. What is it with psychos making Frank their sex slave? This makes the fight much more intense as your movement is restricted and all of your items you had are gone, so you have to beat Kent with your bare hands, which is a lot harder than it sounds, as Kent apparently is a black belt in kung fu. All of the psychos in this game hold a special place in my heart and are easily the most memorable and fun parts of the game. Yeah, many of them can be exploited due to their terrible AI, but they are not something to handle lightly, as one wrong move from you can force you to restart from your last save. Psychos also stick in your mind thanks to their theme songs. Each psycho gets their own anthem that gets stuck in your head, and if you're like me, you found yourself jamming out whilst fighting them. It's honestly worth fighting these guys just to hear their music. Want to listen to some tunes? Follow me! Follow me! I've been a fan of the Dead Rising franchise for well over 10 years now, and I have sunk hundreds of hours into both the first game and Dead Rising 2. My favourite game does have to be the OG though, just because I never seem to get bored of it. The amount of freedom the player is given to explore what they want, kill what they want, and complete whatever scoops they want means it'll take a lot for you to get bored of this game. The first initial playthrough is usually getting the basics down for the game, learning the controls and the basic rules of the game. Typically on this playthrough, given the fact that you are so new to the game, Frank is a measly level 1, so you most likely won't be 
be able to complete all, if not most, of the scoops available. Restarting a save lets you keep the level you were at when you finish that save, giving you that extra advantage you didn't have in your first save, making zombie killing and psychopath fighting much easier. This gives you the tools necessary to play the game to its fullest, exploring every inch of the mall and interacting with everything available at your disposal. Of course you don't have to play like this, freedom is well and truly in your hands. There are many countless ways to spend the three days until the end of the game. There are multiple different endings to the game, so Frank's destiny is up to you. The true ending of the game can only be reached by completing overtime mode, which you unlock after completing the main story in the 72 hour mode. The amount of weapons and tools you have available to use keeps the game interesting and fun. Even after multiple playthroughs, the game never stops being entertaining. Another great mode for scratching that itch to push yourself as a survivor in the apocalypse is infinite mode. In infinite mode, there is no timer, no scoops, and no friendly AIs within the mall. Instead, you are forced to play it smart, scavenging around the mall for weapons and food to make sure you don't starve to death. Survivors you kill around the mall will drop loot like food and weapons, making this game mode feel like one of the first examples of a battle royale. As well as this, you are unable to save your progress, so you can go for as long or as little as you like, but if you die or leave, then your progress will be lost forever. This is definitely one of the most intense features of the game, as there is nothing else that can save you apart from your will to keep pushing you forward. It's also quite sad at the same time, as survivors you have become so familiar with try to attack you, and you will have no choice but to put them down. I just find it hard to stay away from this game for so long, as its charm and fun never seem to get old. There is so much in the game you can miss in one playthrough, but then accidentally run into the next. Even on the home screen, so many people still don't know about the hidden cutscene you can view if you idle for too long. Everything from the characters to the gameplay keeps pulling you in, and it's these reasons the game is just so timeless, and after all these years it's still one of the best open world zombie games to ever exist. The game is great, but not perfect. It's pretty obvious I love Dead Rising at this point. You know, I would marry this game if I could, believe me. But like an honest relationship, I have to admit that the game does have its flaws. I'm sure Capcom would agree that some aspects of Dead Rising are not up to today's standards. That's why a remake can help fix these issues. Now I'm not the CEO of Capcom, so nothing of what I say would 100% be in the game. This is just my hypothetical dream Dead Rising remake. I mean, it goes without saying the game needs a makeover. Even for the time it was released, Dead Rising's graphics weren't exactly cutting edge. In fact, Capcom opted for less detailed graphics in order to have more zombies on screen, so in the end it was a better decision to have low quality graphics. Gaming software has advanced so far now that having to worry about making a game look worse so it runs better shouldn't really be an issue anymore. Dead Rising has even shown this is possible before with Dead Rising 3, and that came out nearly 10 years ago, so Capcom could definitely make the original look drastically better. I know a game's graphics don't reflect its quality, but this improvement could help so much. I mean, better graphics could definitely make the game much more immersive, as characters wouldn't look like walking potatoes or talk with the same animation found when opening and closing a hair clip. <laughs> Apart from psychopaths, Frank, and other characters featured in the main story, survivors around the mall have hardly any dialogue. Many of them share generic dialogue lines with each other, and share the same voice depending on whether they are male or female. This leads to some really weird moments in the game, like when Shinji and Yu, two Japanese tourists who hardly speak any English, yell out and call for Frank in an American accent. Giving all of these survivors their own voice actors and voice lines would go so far in world building, and would help humanise these pretty flat characters. Maybe then players would feel more guilty about leaving them to die. It's not just the outside that needs to be improved, but also the inside. The AI in this game is atrocious. Zombie AI isn't too bad, it's the survivor AI that is the problem. When Frank is in a situation where survivors have to follow him or vice versa, the AI has a complete brain fart and does everything in its path to make things more difficult for itself and the player. The AI has problems detecting when certain objects are in its way, like doors and other survivors, and so they will just constantly keep moving in a certain direction, even if that direction is being obstructed. This goes from being pretty funny to annoying, really really fucking quick, and I can't help but feel this is the aspect a remake should definitely focus on. This without a doubt made the game harder, and so many would argue that the change would perhaps ruin the experience. These people are mental. This would only improve the experience, as so much time is wasted waiting for the AI to grow brain cells. Even if Dead Rising is made easier by this, Capcom could add other things that balance this out, like making zombies stronger for longer, or have survivors have less health. There are so many ways around this. A remake of Dead Rising should also try and add to the experience, so as to not straight up copy the original 
For me, the best way to go about this would be to add new content in the form of weapons, locations, and survivors. Although Dead Rising was ambitious at the time, being one of the first open world zombie games, the scale of the game is no longer that impressive. Like I said before, Dead Rising games have since proven they can push the boundaries of look and scale, and the original Dead Rising could be expanded upon so much. More locations opens up so much more possibility, such as new scoops, story chapters, survivor escorts, and psychopaths, and the passing of time could be slowed down to help with this extra content. This undoubtedly is the biggest hurdle for a remake, as weaving in any more content into Dead Rising's already strict time limit may only be possible if Capcom tweaks the time cycle. A Dead Rising remake at this point in time is a pipe dream, as much as it pains me to say it. The chances of a remake happening are so slim considering that Dead Rising 5 was cancelled, and the lead team in charge of Dead Rising, Capcom Vancouver, was shut down. It would honestly take a miracle for a new Dead Rising game to get released. Hopefully Capcom sees how much the series is missed, and how a remake could reinvigorate Dead Rising, and make it once again one of the most popular open world zombie games, rather than a relic of the past.